Okay, hi everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our uh, monthly talk. Um, I just want to quickly get going uh, with a quick thank you to our sponsors, as we usually do, and then we'll get into it. Um, so as you know, this is FEDSA. Uh, our spon uh, we have some primary sponsors who help us out, keep the lights on, allow us to bring you these talks, all the workshops that we do, and so on. Uh, first off is NML, a uh, software development company in Cape Town, who've been sponsoring us right from the beginning, which is close on 13 years now. Uh, also, IO Digital, who've helped us out over the years in many, many different ways, uh, from offering us space for talks when we used to do them in person and uh, to financial support as well. They're also a software development uh, company in Cape Town. Check them out. And then our workshops are sponsored by Code Capsules, which is kind of uh, which is a um, cloud platform um, based in Cape Town. Uh, it's kind of like Netlify for South Africa. Check it out if you don't if you don't know it. Very very cool platform. Um, so they gener generously sponsor our monthly workshops, as does Code Space Academy, who give us their space in uh, Woodstock ev uh, every uh, every fourth Saturday of the month. Um, to host our workshops there. So thanks very much to all the sponsors. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do this without them. Uh, just some notes on some upcoming events. So uh, ZAPD, which is our uh, partner organization, the South African product design uh, uh, organization. We're running a workshop this Saturday uh, on design sprints, which you may have heard of, uh, uh, popularized by Google. Um, and Almarie, who has given a, a talk for us before, We'll be, talk, we'll be running us through some practical ideas around uh, design sprints, and then we'll also have a, a discussion around whether we think they're good or bad and what the pros and cons of design sprints might be. Uh, then FEDSA related, oh no, sorry, this is not FEDSA related. This is another talk for a different meetup, um, that you, but you might find it interesting. It's Deep South Devs, that's also in Cape Town, and that's a talk on the 8th of August on uh, Figma for developers. I will confess to having uh, snuck this in because I'm giving that talk. <laughs> so maybe I'll see some of you there. Uh, this is an in-person one. Um, you can find uh, Deep South Devs uh, on Meetup. Right, and then uh, FEDSA 26th of August. So in exactly a month's time, uh, we'll be running part two of our modern CSS workshop. Uh, in the first one, we covered variables, container queries, all sorts of things like that. And in this one, we'll be looking at some other modern CSS things like um, mathematical functions, layers, uh, nesting, and so on. So hopefully we'll see you at that one too. We will announce it shortly on Meetup. Right, so on to tonight's talk. Uh, we're very, very grateful and uh, shall I say, no, I'm not going to make it, I'm not going to say we're lucky, but we've got Lucky and Corsi here tonight uh, to talk about something that FEDS has taken very, very seriously over the years, and that's accessibility. We've made a point of uh, doing something for Global Access Accessibility Awareness Day every year, um, and we've had a number of talks on accessibility in the past. So, and this is a great one because we've never had anything around uh, testing. So very, very uh, interested uh, to hear what we, what we learned tonight. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Please post any questions that you might have in the live stream chat. They do pull straight through to our platform here. And we will deal with all those at the end. So I'll keep an eye on the questions and then we'll pop them up at the end uh, for Lucky. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Thanks for being us. And I'll hand over to you, Lucky. Thanks very much. Awesome. Thank you very much, Justin. Cool. So I'm just going to get my slides up on my side. You can see that you're seeing them nicely on your side. Cool. I'll get started. So to kick off today, I'll be talking about accessibility beyond the theory. So how do we ally beyond just the words and the theory? And we'll focus on really looking at how we can integrate accessibility testing into our workflow. To kick us off, tell you a bit about myself. My full name is Ntlantla Lakingosi. Uh, Ntlantla is Zulu for lucky. So as you can see, um, I've got very creative parents when it comes to uh, naming things. So I've inherited good naming conventions. Uh, I juggle a number of things, but uh, primarily I am a software developer at a company called BBD. Uh, started 39 years ago right here in South Africa by three engineers. Uh, we've now grown to be a global 
uh, bespoke software development firm with close to 1,200 professionals uh, operating um, from over seven cities all over the world. We deliver large, mostly business software in a number of sectors from education, uh, public sector, insurance, finance, um, we call it gaming, which is corporate speak for, you know, gambling. Uh, we've operated in the telco space and a number of other different verticals or sectors. My job at BBD, however, is slightly different from everyone else's. That's because I work in a team known as ATC. I always get asked, what does ATC stand for? But I don't think that that's important. What's important is the fact that on paper, we're responsible for BBD's research and development functions. We do what we term specialized consulting because we can't come up with a better term or rather we can't call ourselves firefighters. But what that entails is doing sort of ad hoc consulting services, which includes disaster mitigation. So if there's a project that we fear might not uh, get where we need it to be fast enough, our team is, is usually tasked with going in and helping out uh, people just by bringing a fresh perspective to the problem. So it's not to say that we usually know more, we just usually have fresh eyes. Um, I absolutely, absolutely love community, which is why speaking at meetups like this is important for me. And I've been fueling this passion of mine uh, for a number of years. I was co-organizer of Josie JS. I helped start off Soweto JS, um, and I'm currently helping enable um, other meetups like GDG Joburg and the AWS user groups in Joburg and, and Cape Town, actually, um, through my work here at BBD. Everything I've said to you, you can forget it. It's not really that important. What's actually important is that my Twitter handle is at nlucky underscore ngosi. Please feel free to let me know what you think of this talk. Give me any feedback that you have. Give it to me on Twitter while we still have the platform. Um, and I look forward to hearing from you. I'll jump straight in, straight into it rather. Um, this year is a very stressful year for me. That is because I am about to enter a new decade of my life. And this has been very, very stressful to me. I'm dreading it. And to try and keep up with um, this new person that I'm becoming or to, 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 to try and prepare my body and be fit enough to survive this new decade, I decided that I should probably start keeping healthier and building healthier habits. And the first thing that I tried to do was going to the gym. But I very quickly realized that the gym is not for me because it can be an extremely intimidating place. Just from the equipment to some of the personalities that I realized that it's probably not for me. So I decided to go back and doing stuff that I'm good at and that I enjoy, which is playing soccer and riding horses. Uh, not like that more like this. Uh, this past Sunday, actually, I fell off a horse and hurt my back. Um, but a couple of months ago, I was kicked and that resulted in me damaging my ACL. So that's a picture of me at a conference a couple of months ago with still uh, a whole contraption around my knee. And this experience was very interesting because something interesting started happening to me. I started being very, very grumpy. All of my colleagues and my friends just attributed it to me being um, old or getting old. But when I sat down and thought about it, I realized that what I was getting on my nerves was that for the first time in my life, I was starting to experience life with limited mobility. I hated everything. But the one thing I hated the most was shopping malls. And I hated shopping malls because they're poorly designed. I've never really liked these spaces because they're just big and I have to walk a lot. But my limited mobility made me hate them even more. Everything is just poorly designed. From signage that says there's a shop here, you stop at that entrance, you enter the entrance, only to find that the shop you're looking for is actually 600 meters away from that entrance. So all of these things really annoyed me. And it got me thinking, if I, with my limited mobility, which is just a temporary limitation, I'm so frustrated, how do people with permanent accessibility needs actually navigate spaces like this? A friend of mine pointed out that, but we have ramps everywhere. Um, and so I noticed that these ramps, which were everywhere, a lot of them are actually not practical to use, not even for wheelchair users. 
And I don't know if you've ever tried walking on a ramp with crutches, but I'll tell you this, it's very difficult. And there were spaces where there were no stairs for me to use with my crutches. And, and, and I, I actually ran the risk of falling quite a bit. This made me start wondering, whose responsibility was it to actually make sure that all of the spaces that I'm navigating are accessible to me? And this contemplation made me start pointing fingers. It's the shopping mall's uh, fault, it's the developer's fault, it's the architect's fault, the whole nine yards. But then I started wondering, who's responsible in our field to making sure that the solutions we build are, ex are as accessible to as many people as possible? To answer this question, I think we need a common understanding or common definition as to what accessibility is. You'd have seen the word ally in my title, uh, pronounced Ali, where the 11, or Ali rather, is a numeronym, where the 11 in between A and Y stands for the 11 letters between A and I. So if you've heard of internationalized, internationalization, um, we often shorten that to I18N as well. So num numeronyms are quite cool and I like them. But I looked around a couple of dictionaries and these dictionaries converged to this definition where they talk about accessibility being the quality of being easily reached, entered or used by people who have a disability. This is a very general term. I was quite interested in it in terms of front-end development in general, but specifically the web. So I turned to the World Wide Web Consortium and they define web accessibility to be, oh, to mean that websites, tools, and technologies are designed and developed so that people with disabilities can use them. They're going to specify that it means that these things that we develop are developed so that people can perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with the web that we love so much. And so to answer my initial question of whose responsibility is it, I'll start off and just go straight to the answer and say, it's everyone. That's like effectively asking whose responsibility is it to make sure that the checkout button on a shopping site works. It's absolutely everyone's responsibility. Everyone that's involved in the software development life cycle, that is. We have long agreed that it works on my machine is just not enough. So I wonder why we're so comfortable with shipping code that works for some people and not necessarily everyone else. In my conversations with people around accessibility, I get the sense that people view accessibility as a nice to have or something that we do to benefit people with disabilities, almost as if we're doing them a favor. But addressing accessibility concerns actually has direct business impact. If we consider the fact that almost 15% of the world has digital accessibility needs, it means that inaccessibility in the solutions we build can mean to direct lost revenue. Can you imagine 15% of, say, Amazon's revenues? That's the potential that we have. That's the, that's the potential lost revenue um, when we build solutions that aren't accessible. And what's changing now is that there's this tide of legal requirements. So the US has laws, um, the EU, in fact, I gave a talk recently um, in, in Germany, and they were telling me that in about two years, accessibility in, in, in web based solutions is about to have a lot of laws similar to what we have with Poppy, a lot of those similar laws are about to come up. And the EU isn't unique, even us here in South Africa with the Disability Act, which actually pushes us to try and build um, accessible solutions. And more and more, just as we saw with GDPR turning into Poppy, we're gonna start seeing the uh, uh, addressing accessibility needs becoming a legal requirement. So we need to equip ourselves to make sure that the solutions we build are accessible. So how do we go about doing this? Well, the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, has something called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Now, this is a set of technical guidelines which help us make content more accessible to people with disabilities, people that use the web. And it is effectively separated into 13 guidelines. And these guidelines guide you and they help you develop better solutions. But these guidelines are grouped under four general principles. One concerned with, or the first categories concerned with making sure our stuff is perceivable. 
The second is operable, understandable. And the last one is robust. And we'll touch on to what some of these things mean um, in a second. But again, these are principles that guide us into building better things. If we have guidelines on how to build better things, then we need to develop a way of measuring whether the things we've built are better. And to do this, we have three ways or three levels of conformance which help us measure success. Uh, because, you know, developers are great at naming things. These levels are called A, double A, and triple A. And these are concerned with different things on the spectrum of difficulty. So A level concerns are things like making sure all of our images have alternative text, that we have keyboard accessibility. Double A are a bit more advanced kind of topics to make sure that we deal with uh, or, or, or we address color blindness concerns, making sure that if we have videos, we've got closed captions and the likes. Triple A is slightly more difficult. So this is the more nuanced areas of, 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 of addressing accessibility. And it's more concerned with things like the content that we put out, the comprehension. Do I use 21 words in very convoluted manner to simply say a very simple sentence can, that, that, that can be delivered in just three words? Right, so simplifying our language also forms part of, 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 of addressing accessibility needs. But when you take a look at some of the most common challenges, they're actually the ones that are most easy to address. So the most common challenges found on web uh, browsers are things like the lack of alternative text, inaccessible media, navigation, inaccessible forms, which baffles my mind. Because as a colleague of mine once said, he said, what we do is that we're data shovelers. So we ask the user for some data, we shovel it to a backend, the backend will shovel it into a database and vice versa. And so inaccessible forms really, really, really just baffles me. But also a very old one is the, the lack of keyboard accessibility. I still remember when I started working in this field and I used to work on a project where we were building a banking product. One of the things that we always had to check was that the app is keyboard uh, was that we could navigate the application using just keyboard shortcuts. The reason we did this was to increase the performance of the bank's employees and not necessarily accessibility or, or, or addressing disability concerns. But it baffles me that so many years later, this is still one of the most biggest concerns. And when we think about shortcuts or keyboard shortcuts, research has repeatedly shown us that using keyboard shortcuts directly leads to productivity gains. We can save up to eight workdays per year just by using keyboard shortcuts as opposed to wasting the milliseconds moving our hand and focus away from the keyboard to the mouse. In a recent conversation while chatting to uh, one of the seniors in our company, he told me a story about how we once hired someone to address accessibility specifically. So this person had, had impaired vision and they were responsible for making sure that anything we deploy for this public client for this public service client was accessible and very quickly the client lost interest in this because it was delaying our process and so this got me a bit confused because if your public service client means that we need to make sure the software is usable by every single person and then i realized that what makes it challenging is that we actually perhaps are limited in terms of the tooling we have um, to be able to test all of these things. So we took such a big complex project, gave it to one person instead of developing tools around that. But that was a long time ago. Today, we have a number of tools and effectively this talk is us exploring some of these testing tools for absolutely every single person in our software development lifecycle. To start off, I'll start off with my favorite group of people that I work with. And these are QA engineers, test analyst, whatever you call them, they will stress you if you're a developer. And speaking of manual testers, the W3C has a list of over a hundred tools that you can look at. And all of these tools are aimed at testing accessibility concerns. They call this tool the Web Accessibility Evaluation Tools List. And what I like about this website is that on the left-hand side, they've got filters. And these filters help you address specific regulations, specific things like if you want to focus on um, color blindness, there are tools specifically for that. 
And so I'm going to share with you just some of my favorite accessibility testing tools. We'll start off with a website. We do need something to test with. Um, I like FEDSA, so I decided not to use their website to test this out. Instead, I looked to the Google Chrome Dev Team. So they build a, a website called web.dev, and they build this website that they claim is deliberately uh, inaccessible for demo purposes. Whether that's true or not, I'll leave that up to you to decide. But this uh, website is quite cool. It is on the wrong tab. I'll show you what it looks like now. Just give me a second, and there we go. So this website, I'm running it on CodePen, but in debug mode. And what this means is that you can play around with it without the iframe that has the code, but you can still go and tinker with the code if you go out of debug mode. So this website, deliberately inaccessible, so we can play around with it without making anyone upset. While we're speaking about the Chrome Dev team, one of my favorite tools, and I think every or most web developers should be familiar with it, is called Lighthouse. Lighthouse is a great accessibility testing tool. So you can run Lighthouse straight from your dev tools by clicking inspect. And on one of your tabs, you should have Lighthouse. You simply click analyze page and Lighthouse will test a number of things. It's able to test things like best practices, accessibility, um, accessibility on mobile. It looks at your load times and a whole bunch of things. Right here under this pop-up, there's a checkbox here, or there's a there's a number of checkboxes, and there you can check you can check or uncheck the different things that you want to test. So here specifically, I've opened up accessibility, and it goes and looks at all of the accessibility issues that it goes and finds on the web page that you've pointed it at. The cool thing about this is that it's shipped by default with your browser, and it gives you a score. So this page has gotten a score of 63. And what you then see is that it breaks down what these issues are. So it tells you that this button specifically doesn't have an accessible name. It gives you it, titles like contrast. So you know that these, these concerns or these areas that I'm finding here are concerned about color contrast. It gives you a number of things. But what I like about it as well is that it tells you what audits you passed. It gives you some debug information so that when the test team sends us back to a developer, we can understand exactly what conditions this test was run under. Samuel, here they also tell you what items you need to test manually. So things like making sure that the page has a logical tab order and they're not able to test this for you, which kind of makes sense. And this really brings me to my second favorite tool. And my second favorite tool is called WAVE. Now, WAVE stands for Web Accessibility Evaluation Tool. Um, I don't know how they got to WAVE. I think if we were to take the actual debtors, it would probably would have been weight, which isn't as cool as Wave. And I guess then we can't create this cool logo. But Wave is a browser extension. You can get it on most of your browsers. And what's cool about Wave is that you add it as an extension, but it doesn't live in your dev tools. What Wave does is that it actually goes and annotates the page that you're actually currently on. So here we see that there's six areas, um, there's six major areas, the 17 color contrast issues, there's a couple of alerts, but if you click on details, it will actually break down what all of these areas are and where they are. So if I hi so if I hover on that, it's currently highlighting the title that says Medical Mysteries Club. I can disable that. I can go back and visit it over there. Now that's not uh, uh, highlighted again. But one of the cool things that I like is that if we take a look at um, this about over here, we see that it complains about this. Um, color gradient or the contrast rather. If we go to the contrast tab, we're then able to tinker with it until we see which one of the gradings it actually passes. So if we put it here, it passes for double A, but it fails under triple A, which is the strictest. So if I make it slightly darker with a contrast ratio of seven to one, it now passes both of them without actually changing the fundamental design of my web page. And I think that's really powerful. We saw that the 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 Chrome um, Dev Tools told us that we need to manually check tab order. And when we take a look at the tab order there, Wave goes and annotates all of the different elements on our page. I personally would have expected the main logo to be the first element in my tab order. But when you take a look at it, 
the subscribe button is actually the first element there, which means that, yes, this is probably the most important because we want people to subscribe with our email addresses, but we can't even tap into our input to enter that um, um, uh, email address that we need to begin with. So for us, when we looked at it without these annotations, everything looked perfect, everything looked in order. But for someone who's not using a mouse, who's using just a keyboard, they would not have been able to enter this thing um, as, as, uh, as intuitively. So now that we've seen um, uh, that, I'm just gonna go back to my slide. Um, cool, there we go. This brings me to my next tool. My next favorite tool is called XDevTools. And XDevTools operates just like Lighthouse in that it is an extension. Firstly, like Wave, that it's an extension, but like Lighthouse, that it's in your DevTools. But I'm not gonna show you a demo because when I started preparing this talk, my free uh, license had already expired. And X is probably, or DQ is probably the leader in the space of work. And they've got a lot of incredible um, uh, tools that you use. The core engine though, called X uh, core, that part is open source. Speaking of that, we've addressed QA engineers. Let's talk about my second group of favorite people, project managers. Now for project managers, uh, the type of work that I generally prefer is one way, or, or the, 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 the type of tooling rather is one way I look at things almost as if I'm looking at a dashboard because then that gives me an overview of where the project is, what's lacking and what needs to be addressed quickly. And for that, I'd like to introduce you to something called Pally, your accessibility, your automated accessibility testing pal, right? So Pally is a tool that we, we, we can use in our code firstly. So from their docs, they say that you can simply add it as a command line uh, 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 tool that you then provide with a URL. Pelly will then go and run these tests. Alternatively, you can import text into uh, Pelly rather into our node project, and we can then provide um, some URL in there. Pelly will go and run the test, give you those results. What that looks like is something like this. And as you can see with what I'm doing already is that we can start building out our own node application that goes and runs these tests. So if I replace that URL with the code pen that we just saw, Pally will return to our command line um, something that looks like this. You'll see that it highlights the document title, which is the same as the page that we were on. It then goes on to tell us which guidelines we have violated. It tells us that this is an error. One of the things that I like about it is that it also gives you the selector. So you know exactly where to find the problems with the stuff. So what I ended up managing to build with this is this called a local or rather my accessibility tester. So if I provide it with a website and if my server is running, which I hope it is, I didn't check, there we go. So Peli returns from that node backend with all of the issues on my URL, which means that I can even test this URL itself so if you go localhost 3000 and I run my test, there we go. It goes and tells me that these are the problems that it found. So it's padding with the previous one, right? So these are all of the issues and we can now start addressing those things. I got really excited when I got to a point where I was building this. And then because I'm a JavaScript developer, I started getting suspicious. I'm very suspicious when I build something that feels new because chances are, there's a JavaScript developer somewhere that's done this already. And I came across this called the Pally dashboard, where there's a couple of templates that you can go and use to monitor all of the different accessibility issues on a number of your pages. So, but I still found significant value in being able to customize my own one because I work mostly in an enterprise environment where the solutions we build are usually very, very unique. But if the only time we catch accessibility issues is once they're in production, then it's too late. What we actually need to do is, is, is stop the problem far earlier in the software development lifecycle. And testing isn't new to developers. 
And the idea is to integrate this testing into the development workflow and not just after we've handed over to maybe your DevOps team or once it's in production or QA. And it's not that I don't trust developers. I do. I'm a developer myself. Um, but it's because I'm also a developer that I know that sometimes you just forget to test or sometimes you think you tested and then, you know, the test just fails in production. And so I found that the best way to make sure that your developers conform to standards is to simply block the pull requests if they don't conform to our commonly established standards. So what we actually need to do is we need to find a way to automate this accessibility testing, and then we block those pull requests if those tests fail. If your development lifecycle looks something like this, where a developer makes some code changes and then pushes those changes to a server, and then those changes get um, um, up, merged into main once they're approved. What we need to do is add one more step where we run a test before we merge, where we check if the code changes we've introduced are accessible. So effectively, to show you the demo that I just showed, I had to start up a server. I then had to launch my browser. I went to local host. I have no idea why I made that a chicken. That's hilarious. Uh, we have to wait for it to load because we know that loading a web page can take some time. And then only once it's loaded, we need to go and run Peggy, which means that we need to be able to do this in memory. We can do this in our terminal. Uh, let me see if I can get my code up, see VS code with the correct code base. I've got a couple of projects open here. So if I stop this project and I run Yan test, I'm assuming it is the correct test case. It is so that it ran Peli on two URLs that are configured, and it's telling me that on these URLs that I've configured, these are the issues that I've got. But this is all running on my local machine. What we need to do is we need to do this on our um, CI, right? Our continuous integration pipeline. And so for this, Peli has a different add on called Peli CI. Now, Peli CI is an accessibility test runner that's built on top of Peli, and we use it to run our um, uh, continuous integration environments. I contemplated using a number of um, environments, and I settled on GitHub because GitHub is still one of the most widely used um, Git repository uh, platforms. GitHub is something called GitHub Actions, which help us um, automate an, uh, uh, our, our continuous integration pipeline and our release pipeline. So if you've put together front-end testing on a web platform, you probably needed a combination of these things. So first you need a test runner. So these are things like Mocha and Jasmine and the likes. You need an assertion library, which helps you write your rules. So things like, I expect the sum of two things to be this other thing. And because we're concerned with actually um, rendering things on the browser or how things are rendered, we also need a browser. And we can use a headless browser with his own, which we can think of as an in-memory browser. And examples of this are things like Puppeteer or just the basic headless Chrome. What I like is that there's a tool called, or this library called Jest. Jest falls right between those two categories of being both a test runner and, a, and an assertion library. And judging or straight from the website, they say that Jest is a delightful JavaScript testing, uh, testing framework with a focus on simplicity. I don't often see delightful in JavaScript in one sentence. So when I saw it, I decided, absolutely, this is it. And I haven't turned back since. So using Jest is quite simple. If you have a function that sums two things, we can write our test by describing what it does. So this test adds one and two and equals to three. Uh, we then tell it what we expect it to be by calling the function itself. So it actually goes and execute our, our function. So here, if we have one plus two, we know that this should be three, but if what it gets versus what we expected it to be don't match, it then tells you, and this is what that would look like. So it tells you that this test failed. Um, it expected six, it received three. Obviously here, the problem is that my, my, my test was written incorrectly, but you can see that the behavior didn't match. And so it flagged that and broke our tests for us, which means that we can extend that we spoke about X earlier, and I mentioned that the X core library itself is open source. And there's a couple of um, matches that have been developed since 
to match up things like Jest with X, Jest with Pally. And so here we have an example where I'm importing Jest X and I'm using Jest X. What that allows us to do is that we can create a component like this, right? Where we say this div has an image and we need to render it. But when we render it with X, we expect it to have no X violations, right? Which means that if I run this, JSTX comes back to me and says, similar to the unit test that we saw, it says that this test failed because, and the rule that it failed by is that all page content should be contained by landmarks. Now, if you look at the previous test that I've been doing, we were doing tests on entire pages. In spaces that I work in, I very seldom have to build entire pages. I often, or more often than not, I'm concerned with smaller components that fit into a bigger page, which means that this rule is no longer actually uh, uh, applicable to this scenario that I have over here. So what X or just X allows me to do is to then go and configure those rules. So a rule like regions doesn't make sense in components. It only makes sense in pages. And so I would disable it for tests that goes in that, that test components only. But if we're waiting for developers to run tests and build all of the stuff, sometimes that's late. Personally, I want to know that I'm doing something wrong as soon as I do it. And the best way to do that is to get linters. So I have an X accessibility linter um, in my code base. So this is a VS code extension, again, built by DQ University. And what this linter does is that while you're typing, it's able to take a look at the code and do static code analysis and tell you the obvious problems that it can find. So on the screen, you can see I've got an image, it's a source, but the image doesn't have any alternative text. And so to address this, I can simply see what the issues are. It even suggests a number of quick fixes for me. So we've now seen how we can stop developers in our CI pipeline. We've seen how we can um, guide developers to running things better on their local machines. And when I spoke to one of my colleagues, he said, the problem that he fears is that if I configure my CI pipeline to run all of these tests, we're going to have a lot of developers that just push up code in hopes that the CI pipeline will stop the issues and tell them what the problem is. He wanted something that would stop the developer before using up our cloud resources, our build agents, and hogging up the production line. And so I introduced him to something called Husky. So Husky is a very interesting tool that allows us to write some Git hooks, which means that using something like Husky, we're able to run tests on every single commit on the developer's machine, which means that the same test that we run on our GitHub CI pipeline or our Travis CI or our DevOps or TimCity, whatever tool you use, you can run the exact same test on the developer's machine so that what we use our build agents for is literally just a last step verification process. So if we take a look at my browser over here, I've got an old pull request open. And you'll see that this pull request over here has failed. It failed and therefore I cannot actually complete this pull request. And if I take a look at it, it says that um, this test code for LE issues has failed. And when I open it up, it shows me over here that there are three errors. It also guides me, just as we saw on my uh, manual tester, that this is where the problem is on this form. This is how you get to it. It's HTML in the body, the nth child or the second child, and there you'll find a form. It tells me what principle I have um, um, sort of um, violated, and it also gives me a text-friendly description of what I've done. So here as a developer, I can go and see what problems I've introduced. What happens on the local machine is that if I try to commit, right, it will run that test and it will tell me that this has failed. In the terminal there, just behind the git command, you'll see that there's some text that's giving me the exact same information that I would have gotten in my CI pipeline without the code leaving my machine and using up our cloud resources. So quick run through before I close off. We've looked at addressing accessibility concerns by monitoring so we built a dashboard and we use Pally with node to do that we then looked at or first we, we started off with manual lish testing where we saw tools like lighthouse x and wave 
And now we've just concluded our automated testing portion where we look at uh, things like gatekeeping our main branches using things like Pally CI, testing on a component level with things like Chest X, and using a Husky and Git hooks to stop the code from even leaving the developer's machine um, if it is inaccessible. The last thing that I'll show you is tools for designers because I believe there are sometimes some of the biggest culprits of this is developers will take a design as is and just go and build it. So there's a number of tools. One of my favorite is this one called Able. Um, they describe it as a friction-free accessibility tool. What, what, one of the things that I like about um, this tool is that it shows you uh, or it tries to simulate what people with different color blindness restrictions would have. And it shows you what percentage of the population has that so you can prioritize what you address first. There's a few other tools. We have one called Contrast Checker and Contrast Checker checks, um, or what I like about it is that it checks the color contrast and it tells you which one of the standards it passes both on normal text as well as large text. Microsoft Design also has one focused on focus order. Um, eBay has one that uh, looks at things like landmarks, focus groups, um, and a number of things. And because we're talking about X and DQ, they also have X for designers, which means that if you use a tool like this, you make sure that your project managers, your testers, your designers, and your developers all speak the same language, which means that if someone finds a problem, they're using the same language to communicate what the issue is and how we can address it. So we've looked at how we can integrate accessibility testing into every part of our software development lifecycle. We've looked at tools for every single person that's involved in it. But we must proceed with caution. All of the tools I've shown you today are not a silver bullet that just solves all of our problems. Automated testing has its limitations. In fact, it said that less than 40% of issues can be picked up by automated testing. Uh, DQ University claims that they're able to catch over 60% of accessibility issues. And I think that's just testament to how much work is being done in the space. We can only automate tests for known issues and we cannot cover every possible accessibility issues. There's a number of false positives and false negatives. And there's a lot of contexts that we operate in where we need to configure these tools to make sure that they make sense for our space. So there is no one rule to uh, beat them all. And it also doesn't replace user ex experience. I'll close off by quoting a modern philosopher, ChatGPT, who says, it's important to remember that automated testing must be used in conjunction with manual testing. We cannot stress that enough. And user testing is important to ensure the highest level of accessibility possible. I'll leave you with those parting thoughts. My name is Lakin Gosi. Thank you very much. Again, you can catch me on Twitter. And if you'd like to get some of the crazy thoughts in my head, I do write some blogs sometime on the dev.to platform. That's me. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Lucky. That was really fantastic. Um, I'm very glad you you did that bit at the end about the designers um, and that accessibility can actually start right at that point rather than <laughs> we've already gone to dev and then we're discovering uh, that um, there were a whole lot of uh, issues on the way that we didn't um, we didn't catch earlier. Um, does anyone have any comments uh, for Lucky? I see some very uh, nice. Uh, question sorry some very nice comments everyone um enjoying the present enjoyed the presentation so thanks for that um i'll just pop these up on the screen so when people re-watch um they can see um that we have these comments um i have a question um and i'm sure it's one you probably hear a lot um you started off by talking about you know the necessity for access accessibility and some of your own experiences um, and I, what I liked a lot about it was that, you know, we tend to, uh, access, uh, disability is often seen as like a, a permanent thing and it's often not the case. Um, yeah. and we need to be really thinking about that as we go along. Um, but then you also spoke about money, <laughs> uh, and, and how much, um, not 
having accessible experiences can cost. And I think that's obviously an imperative from a kind of business side. And then there's, there's also the ethical considerations around accessibility. And you touched on that as well. And um, I really like the way you've gone through the whole cycle of introducing testing and so on. Um, and I'm sorry if this is a mundane question, but who pays for this? Because <laughs> it's something that that is at the back of my mind always. I mean, I'm, I'm very adamant that we are doing accessibility work, but people who control purse strings aren't always that keen on it. Um, do you have any, any kind of suggestions on how to approach that? And you can appeal to people's ethical values, but that's not always going to work. Yeah. Um, so I think, um, firstly, it's the, the, the mandate of the platforms that we're building. Right. So mm -hmm. if we are if we are building an educational platform, you need to do a study to take a look at who uses this platform. Um, yeah. What percentage of your students uh, uh, will have accessibility needs? And I'll give you a very simple example. We are building um, at the moment. One of the teams that uh, I lead is is building a solution to look at education around matric versus matric and first year students. And mm -hmm. we built it very quickly and in a rush because we were trying to prove value. And we right. we could see the, the 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 concerns around color blindness needs and we mm -hmm. ignored them. Right? Right. And we went quickly. And the first batch of testing that we did, we had two students that were colorblind that couldn't complete our assessment. And so our problem right. hit us. Yes, we knew it, we expected it, but now we couldn't get the data points that were so crucial to us. So I think yeah. the first thing is, what is the purpose of a platform that you do? The second is, mm -hmm. and I touched on it, is that if we're looking at something like an online store, you run the risk of losing 15% of your revenue, right? Yeah. And you convert that to hard numbers. Those are mm -hmm. numbers that you cannot run away from. And those things or those numbers are around the permanent accessibility needs. Right, we're not even talking about the temporary ones that might come and go. Mm, mm, the permanent yeah. one, is the fifteen percent of your revenue. So, when we start using tools like this, we simplify the process of validating the work that we do. So, if you go and you in, and you and you include uh, accessibility testing in your CI pipelines, your developers will hate you. I can guarantee oh, yes. you that. The first <laughs> month is going to be absolute nightmare. But I do this exercise with juniors um, on my team when we talk about building HTML, is that no one is allowed to use a div or a span. We must use semantic elements only. If you use a div, mm. you must present to us at stand up why you need the div and why you can't find an accessible element. And the Excellent. first couple of weeks, it is absolutely stressful for them. But what Mayhem. I notice <laughs> very soon after that, right, because they've now taken the time to go and find other uh, other meaningful semantic elements, they discover mm. others that even I haven't come across, right? And I start seeing them in the code. I'm like, whoa, what is this? And I go and tweet up about it. But because it becomes part of their tool set, the effort it takes to make sure that things are accessible is not that much. So if you think yeah. about something as simple and common as alt text, it's been reinforced so much. If you post a, a picture on Twitter, we expect to see alt text, right? We judge yes. you if your image doesn't have alt text. And so developers have developed um, this idea of adding alt text doesn't seem as extra work now. It's just part of what I'm doing. And so if yeah. we start automating and gatekeeping um, the quality of our work at every single stage, right? We make sure that the quality that we deliver is, is firstly good, but it also becomes easier and normal for us or for this yeah. to be a step. If you think 20 years ago, you had developers that we were developing stuff without designers, right? I look at some of the stuff that I worked on before, and I'm amazed that, <laughs> that we were able to do what we did, right? Cancel and some of it's still out there. A lot of it is out there, right? I worked on a system in 2017. At the time, the system was 20 years old. Today, that system is still running, right? Yeah. And it's a very meaningful system. So design yeah. was also seen as a thing that is nice to have. And people asking the exact same question, who pays for it? Well, we have to because yeah. we're competing. 
right? Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. And we want to provide services. Yeah, just before we get onto the question, yeah, I think that's a really good way to approach it, to just to make it a part of what you naturally do, rather yeah. than an extra thing that you now need to do. It's just part of your everyday work. Um, I always think about, gosh, 10, what was it, 12 years ago, whatever, when we started using media queries and doing responsive design. That was like an extra thing that you did, right? It was like, and people would advertise their services and then they'd have an extra thing at responsive design, you know, like it was, <laughs> now we don't even think twice about it. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully that's where we get to as a point with, with introducing accessibility as well. We've got a question from Knox. Um, do you recommend the browser-based tools you shared to assist in conducting an accessibility audit? And what do you recommend is the best first step to start an audit? Uh, that's a great question. What's where, where do you start? Brilliant question. Um, I would I would recommend the manual tools. Um, they will bring things that you didn't think about immediately to your attention. Mm -hmm. So tools like building a dashboard are great when you're looking at an existing system and you want to make it more accessible. You 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 probably can't afford to stop your entire development. Um, in order to address accessibility needs in a big bang. You probably need to take a much more phased approach where whenever you have some downtime, you can address um, the, the more difficult ones or the, the less urgent issues. And so I would use things like the dashboard parts that I showed you to track our improvement over time. Whereas the manual tools that are browser-based are really good at showing you things immediately um, everyone can use them, which means everyone can immediately start talking the same language without installing anything extra. Um, because when we look at the automated parts, someone needs to take some time to understand them, configure them, put them into place, get everyone else's buy-in. But with the tools, we can discuss it in principle, and then everyone can go and start addressing these issues. So yes, you can do a, a, a yes, I think that is the best first step to 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 doing a proper audit of your site great great thanks so much um any other questions from the chat anyone else have anything to add okay well i think we can call it then almost the hour which is great thanks again thanks so much that was a really fantastic talk um takes youtube about 24 hours to de encode everything and then it's um uh, will be uh, will be available for rewatching and sharing on our channel. Uh, we always post the link the next day in the Z in our ZA Tech channel, um, so we'll post it there. Please share if you can. I think this is really a great talk, um, one of the and, and and such an important topic for everyone. Um, yeah, it, as you say, who whose responsibility is accessibility? It's everyone. And yeah. so th thanks so much for all the insights and, and also great practical uh, information and advice. So, Thank so you very thanks much. Thanks again. Yes. Thanks to everyone who joined us. Uh, we'll see you at the next one. Cheers. Cheers.